Our discussion of today is a continuation of the 10 factors that the second kalima of Muhammad Rasulullah, the 10 factors that this kalima necessitates. In our previous episode, we had discussed four of these 10 and we'll continue today with the discussion of the remaining six. The next factor that is necessitated by our testimony of Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the belief, the firm belief that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left us with a complete message and a complete guidance. We have no need to go anywhere else for any other source of guidance. And this is proven in many, many verses and many, many ahadith. One such hadith is a beautiful hadith narrated by Al-Tabarani in his Al-Mu'jam Al-Kabir, volume 2, page 156, in which the Prophet wasallam said that there is not a single matter which brings you closer to Jannah, to paradise, except that I have already told you about it. You know it. And there is not a single matter which brings you closer to the fire of hell, except that I've already warned you against it. Not a single matter. The guidance is complete. And this is a firm implication of Muhammad Rasulullah. When we testify that Muhammad وسلم, is the messenger of Allah, the implication is that the source of guidance will be attained through his knowledge. He is the messenger. He is the one who Allah sent. After narrating this very hadith, the famous companion Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, he is the one who narrated this hadith. He said, by Allah, I swear that the Prophet sallallahu has told the truth. Because there is not a single bird flapping its wings in the skies, except that he has told us what we need to know regarding that bird. So complete is his knowledge that he has left us with, that we have no need to go to any other source for guidance. And really, you will think that Abu Dhar was being metaphorical, he's just trying to give an example. But I say no, even on its literal face value, the Prophet ﷺ told us what birds we can eat, what birds we can't eat. He told us how to kill those birds, how to sacrifice them, everything has been told to us. So it's not just a metaphor, it is actual a literal expression, that there is not a single bird that flaps its wings in the skies, except that the Prophet ﷺ has told us what we need to know regarding this bird. The point is that our source of guidance, our only source of guidance is the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. He has left us with all that we need to know. We don't need to go anywhere else. In another beautiful hadith in the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim, volume 1, page 97, the Prophet ﷺ said that indeed I have left you with two things. I have left two things amongst you. As long as you hold on to them, you will never go astray. So what are these two things that the Prophet ﷺ has left us with? He said, Kitab Allah wa Sunnati. The book of Allah and my Sunnah, my example. So the Quran and the Sunnah are the ultimate source of sources of guidance. We have no other source besides these two. And this is a fundamental byproduct of our testimony of Muhammad Rasulullah. If he really and truly is the Rasul of Allah, if he really and truly has been sent to us by Allah, then he has told us all that we need to know. There is not a single thing that we need to know except that he has told us about it. And another implication, another factor that this necessitates is that there is no guidance that is acceptable to follow except his guidance. This is the sixth of the ten points, which is a follow-up of the fifth one. We cannot turn to another source for ultimate guidance. If we were to do so, we are claiming that that person or that object is the Rasul of Allah. What is the meaning of Rasul Allah? What is the meaning that he is sent by Allah? It means there is a direct link, a communication between him and our Creator. He is the one that tells us what we have to do, what we don't have to do, when to do it and how to do it. So to turn to any other source for guidance, to claim that I don't have to follow the Prophet I can follow another person, or I can take this opinion or that opinion, this is really to deny that he is the Rasul of Allah. Allah says in Surah Furqan, verse 27 and 28, The day that the transgressor, the wrongdoer, will be biting his fingers. In other words, he will be in a state of regret. And he will say, Oh woe to me! Ya laytan ittakhadtu ma'ar rasuli sabila. Oh woe had I only followed the path of the messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Woe to me that I only followed this path. Why did I follow the path of so-and-so? This is what he says in the Quran, look it up. Why did I follow the path of so-and-so? How I wish that I would never have known him. How I wish I had nothing to do with him. So-and-so meaning any person besides the Prophet 
In yet another verse, Surah An-Nur, verse 54, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that obey Allah and obey the messenger. Obey Allah and obey the messenger. If you turn away, then know that you will bear what sins you have done and they will have to bear what they have done. وَإِن تُطِيعُوهُ فَاهْتَوْدُ This is the point. وَإِن تُطِيعُوهُ If and only if you obey him, تَهْتَدُوا You will achieve guidance. The only way to achieve guidance is by obeying the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If someone wishes to be guided, Allah says here is a condition and the response to that condition. وَإِن تُطِيعُوهُ تَهْتَدُوا If you obey him, you will be guided. The implication for this is if you don't obey him, if you refuse his guidance, if you go somewhere else for guidance, then you will not be guided. And yet another verse in the Quran, and we're going to emphasize this point over and over again because this is the whole point of Muhammad Rasulullah, that we have to follow him. His example is the best. In another verse, Surah Qasas, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Surah Qasas verse 50, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِن لَمْ يَسْتَجِيبُوا لَكَ If they do not respond to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then know that they are following their desires. If they don't respond to you, if they don't take guidance from you, then they are following their desires. There is no other source for guidance. This is another beautiful verse. They either respond to you and are guided, or they are following their desires and they have rejected you. The only way to be guided is to follow the teachings of the Prophet wasallam as manifested in the Quran and the Sunnah. This is the sixth point. The seventh of the ten points is again a logical follow-up of this. And that is that when we differ amongst ourselves, when there is some difference of opinion, what should we do, what should we not do, where do we go to for guidance? Obviously we turn back to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, and of course the Qur'an first and foremost. Allah says in Surah An-Nisa verse 65, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Nay, by your Lord, O Muhammad, they will never believe. This is a very important verse, pay attention here now. Nay, by your Lord, Allah swears by your Lord, mentioning the Prophet ﷺ to honor him. He could have sworn by any other name. He could have sworn by any other characteristic or method. But he said by your Lord, to emphasize the status of the Prophet وسلم, mentioning him in this oath by your Lord they will never have Iman, have faith until they take you until they take you O Muhammad to be the judge, the arbitrator, the one who resolves their disputes in all that they have differed concerning the first point that they take you as their judge then Allah says ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُ فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتُ Then they do not find in their hearts any haraj, any discomfort. They don't feel some type of unease about what you have decided. Then the third, وَيُسَلِّمُ التَّسْلِيمَ They sub say, submit themselves completely. In this verse, Surah Nisa, verse 65, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions three very important things. And He swears that they will never have faith. Nobody will have faith until they take the Prophet وسلم, as the one who resolves all disputes. You have a difference of opinion, what is haram, what is halal, what is prohibited, what is not, what should I do, what should I not do? Take it back to the Quran and Sunnah. Take it back to what the Prophet وسلم, had to say. And then, do not feel in your hearts some, uh, com some discomfort, a feeling of unease about what Allah and His Messenger have said, and submit wholeheartedly to that command. If we do not do this, we do not have Iman as per the statement in the Qur'an. In another very beautiful hadith, Akhi, if you can hand me uh, Sunan ibn Majah, volume 1. In a, another very beautiful hadith, the Prophet ﷺ also explained and expounded on this very principle. And this hadith is, is a famous hadith known as the hadith of Irbad ibn Sariya. The hadith of Irbad ibn Sariya where the Prophet Sallallahu said, I have indeed left you upon the shining path. Its night is like its day. No one will deviate from this path except that he wishes to be destroyed. In other words, the point of this is, only the one who wishes to be destroyed will not be able to find the answer. Any person who turns to the Quran and Sunnah, turns to the path of Allah and the path of the Messenger of Allah, wanting to seek guidance, he will find that guidance. Wanting to know the truth, if a person wants to know the correct opinion in any issue, 
and he turns wholeheartedly, sincerely to the Quran and Sunnah, he will find that answer. The point of the hadith is the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever lives long amongst you will see a lot of differences of opinion. People will differ about everything. So if you see this, then I command you to follow my sunnah. I command you to stick to my example and the example of the pious predecessors or the, uh, the khulafa, the khalifas after me. Stick on to it, hold on to it, bite on to it. This is what the Prophet ﷺ said. The point of the hadith is when you see ikhtilaf, when you see differences, when you see people differing about everything, they've differed about Allah Azza wa Jal, they've differed about the Prophet ﷺ, they've differed about the Sahaba, they've differed about halal and haram, prohibited everything, is a matter of difference. What do you do? You take it back to the Quran and to the Sunnah. If you don't do so, then you are in fact claiming you don't believe in Muhammad Rasulullah We'll take a short break and we'll continue in the rest of the 10 points. Stay with us. History has witnessed the rise and fall of civilizations across the globe. Civilizations that were assumed infallible are now in ruin. Jimmy Jones. But one civilization is still standing and is still standing strong. And it is growing wider and larger. The civilization that is based on divine guidance. The civilization of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his followers. Let us renew that civilization. Join Jimmy Jones in Renewing the Civilization tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 8.30 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. Confusion, conflict, lack of values, lack of genuine faith, living life unaware. Religions manipulated, misunderstood, religious scriptures altered and modified for petty gain. In all this belly, I will strive to expose the truth. Because it's your right to know and my duty to tell the truth. Let falsehood perish. Watch Dr. Zakir Naik in Truth Exposed, next on Peace TV. Welcome back. We were discussing the seventh of the ten principles that are necessitated by Muhammad Rasulullah. And this one was the obligation to return to it at times of dispute. In Surah Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ If you disagree about anything, whether it's something small, whether it's something big, shay means anything, the smallest to the biggest, then take it back to Allah and His Messenger. رُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ Take it back to Allah and take it back to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Well, what should we do? Can we talk to Allah? Of course not. The meaning is take it back to the Sunnah. I mean, take it back to the Quran, which is the book of Allah, and the Sunnah, which is the statements of the Messenger of Allah. So the verse, while the Prophet ﷺ is alive, you literally take it back to Allah and His Messenger. You go to the Prophet ﷺ and you ask him the question. Now that the Prophet ﷺ has passed away, we take it back to the Quran and the Sunnah. When we differ about anything, take it back to the Quran and the Sunnah if you truly believe in Allah and the Day of Judgment. Allah says so in the Quran, look it up yourselves. If you truly believe in Allah and the Day of Judgment, then when you differ about anything, take it back to the Quran and the Sunnah. Don't take it back to my opinion, your opinion, this methodology, that ph philosophy, no. Our source for guidance, our only source for guidance is the Quran and the Sunnah. These are our ultimate authorities. Take it back to the Quran and take it back to the Sunnah. The speech of Allah and the speech of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The eighth of the ten principles is the fact that we must worship Allah based upon His example and no one else. He is our example, our role model, our Imam, our leader. What does it mean that He is the Messenger of Allah? It means that He is the one whom Allah Azza wa chose to speak 
spread the message to the people, which means he must have implemented it better than anyone else. And in fact, when, when Allah describes the Prophet in the Quran وسلم, by the phrase Abdullah, the phrase Abdullah, and he uses this phrase four or, four time, four or five times in the Quran, at the times of the highest praise, the highest praise that the Prophet وسلم, has been given in the Quran is Abdullah. The meaning of Abdullah is the one who has perfected the worship of Allah. This is the meaning of Abd in this context. The one who has perfected the worship of Allah. No one has worshipped Allah the way that he deserves to be worshipped like the Prophet ﷺ. And this is clearly proven in the Quran and in the Sunnah. Um, Akhi, if you can hand me volume 8 and 9 of Bukhari, you might, do, might as well do both volumes at once. While he's getting that, let's look at a verse in the Quran, Surah Ahzab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهُ وَالْيَوْمُ الْآخِرِ That you have, Jazakallah khair, khair. You have for you, in the conduct of the Messenger of Allah, in his example, in his guidance, a perfect role model. Uswatun hasana. Something you should follow, something you should imitate, emulate, for those who believe in Allah in the final day. This is yet another important testimony, or this is another factor which our testimony of Muhammad Rasulullah wasallam necessitates. That we worship Allah based upon his example and only his example. In a beautiful hadith in Sahih Bukhari, volume 8, hadith number 4886, a person came to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, a woman, and she said that I heard that you curse the women who put tattoos on themselves and those who put tattoos on other women and, and some other people as well and those who change the creation of Allah. What right do you have to curse those whom Allah and His Messenger have not cursed? So she's now arguing with Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud says, and she said, she said that how can you curse those whom Allah does not curse? So Ibn, ibn Mas'ud said, Allah has cursed them. So she responded, I have read the Quran from cover to cover. I know the Quran cover to cover and it doesn't say anything about tattoos. How can you prohibit something that's not in the Quran? So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, had you really read the Quran, had you really read it, you would have read the verse, وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ Whatever the Prophet ﷺ gives you, take it, and whatever he forbids you, stay away from it. And I heard the Prophet ﷺ say that Allah's curse is upon the woman who puts a tattoo on herself and the one who puts tattoos on others to the end of the hadith. In other words, you need to go back to the sunnah. You need to see the example of the Prophet ﷺ in order to fully understand the Sharia or the Islamic law. In yet another instance, Sahih Bukhari, Volume 9, Hadith 5063, three people came to Aisha. Three people came to Aisha, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, and they asked her about the worship of the Prophet ﷺ. How did he used to worship Allah? What was his methodology? So she informed him of his daily schedule. She informed the three people of the daily schedule of the Prophet ﷺ, and they thought that this was not that much worship. They were not too impressed. And they said, this is the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All of his sins have been forgiven. Who are we? We need to do more than this. So one of them said, as for me, I'm going to fast every single day of my life. The other one said, as for me, I'm going to pray every single night of my life. And the third one said, as for me, I will never touch women, never get married. This is going to be my worship. So they heard the example of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they turned away from it and used their own opinions above the Messenger of Allah. What happened then? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heard of this. And he called the General Assembly, he called the people to the masjid. And he said, how come certain people are saying this and this? And he described what happened. Verily, I am the one who fears Allah the most amongst you. And I am the one who has the most knowledge amongst you. And I fast sometimes, and I break my fast. And I pray some nights, and I don't. I go to sleep as well, and I marry women. Whoever rejects my sunnah has nothing to do with me. Whoever leaves my sunnah has nothing to do with me. So this is the point. Muhammad Rasulullah we take his example. We don't go more, we don't go less. Whatever he did, this is how we worship Allah. Whatever he did not do, then it is not proper for us to worship Allah with something He didn't do. 
If we do so, we're falling into the same mistake of these people as well. The ninth of these ten points is that we have to love his family members. We have to love the family members of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says in Surah Ahzab, verse 33, The Ahl al-Bayt are the family members of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says that Allah wishes to purify you of all evil, of all dirt, of all filth, and to make you blessed and pure. And the family members of the Prophet Sallallahu are his daughters and their progeny after them, and also his wives as well. So all of the family members of the Prophet Sallallahu we have to love them and respect them. Those that were Muslims obviously, because some of the family members of the Prophet Sallallahu they did not accept Islam. Those that did, we have to love them a special love, an extra love. In one hadith, he said that, this is before he died, he said, I remind you concerning the rights of my family members. I remind you concerning the rights of my family members. In other words, don't transgress in their rights. And this is a very important point and we have to be careful we don't go to the two extremes. Once again, Islam is always the middle path between the two extremes. Because certain groups of people have rejected the high status of the, the, mess, of the family of the Prophet ﷺ, And they've abused them and ridiculed them. This is one extreme. The other extreme has exalted their status far above what they deserve. In fact, they've even given them names and attributes that only Allah is worthy of. As they are all knowledgeable, all powerful, they control the creation. This is another extreme. As usual, we are always in the middle between the two extremes. We give them the rights that are due upon them and we don't go beyond that. We love them, we respect them, we defend them. Whenever we mention their names, we say radiallahu anhum. This is of the matters which is obligatory upon us to love the family members of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam without going to the two extremes. And the tenth of the ten matters, the tenth of these and the final of these is that we love his companions as well. Now his family members are also his companions but they have a higher status. The companions, they, they too must be loved, all of them. So the family of the Prophet ﷺ has two rights over us. The rights, the fact that they are the family and the rights that they are companions. And the companions, they too have a right over us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in more than one verse in the Quran, Allah is pleased with them and He is pleased with them. In another uh, hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, the best of my nation are my companions. And then those who follow them and then those who follow them. So of the fundamental principles of Muhammad Rasulullah is that we take the understanding of the companions and the early generations above our own understanding. The pious predecessors, we go back to them, especially the Sahaba. We take their understanding and their opinions above our own. In one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, and this hadith we quoted in uh, Sunan Abi Dawood, that I command you to follow my sunnah and the sunnah or the path of my Khulafa al-Rashidin al mahdiyin the Khalifas or the Caliphs that will come after me. And yet another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, do not curse my companions because if one of you were to give the entire mountain of Uhud, which is a huge mountain in Medina in gold, you would not reach their level. So we must respect them, defend them, love them, honor them, never speak any word of evil about them. The smallest word of evil about them, it is not permissible to say evil about the companions. Whatever happened with them, we remain quiet about evil. We only praise them, we love them, we respect them. If there are some problems that happen between them, historically speaking, then we don't say anything but good about them. We have no right to criticize them or say anything about them. And this is one of the important matters that is necessitated by Muhammad Rasulullah. We conclude these two segments by stating that it is not just sufficient to verbalize Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. No. Rather, when you say it, there must be certain factors, there must be certain matters that are necessitated by it. And the one verse that really sums up all that we have said is Surah Ali Imran, verse 31, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you really love Allah, if you really and truly love Allah, then follow me, Allah will love you. In kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fattabi'uni yuhbibkum Allah. You claim that you love Allah, you claim that you love the Messenger of Allah, put it up into practice, show it. Follow the example, follow the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then and only then have you really and truly affirmed Muhammad Rasulullah.
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This brings us to the conclusion of today's talk. We hope to see you next time. Until then, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.